Hear me okay. Yes. Good. Welcome everyone. This is our March, can you believe it's March? Meeting of the Mecklenburg Audubon Society. I'd like to welcome all the new members. And in fact, we've got several on our list here <clears throat> as usual. But we also, I know, have at least a couple of the members here tonight. So with the new members present here today, tonight, stand up and identify yourself by me. Hey. Hey. Um, hi, my name is uh, Doc Stenton, and I live down in Indian Trail. Um, I've been birding for a few years now, and um, happy to be working. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Ratchin. I live in Indian Land, South Carolina. New resident of the Carolinas from Wisconsin last May. And uh, this is my first online meeting. I joined the club actually last month. Yeah. That was too long. Tom's my, uh, my neighbor. Anyone else? These are the folks we need to thank for the refreshments that you see back there. <clears throat> Chocolate's a food group, by the way, yeah. So we thank those folks for the refreshments and thank you for our refreshment, sorry, us. Janet has been delayed. We hope she'll be here in a while. If she comes, I'm sure she'll have a sign up sheet for next month for refreshments. Janet also is the one who signs everybody in and provides labels for you all. So a reminder to all of you please at least sign in over there before you leave so we know who attended here. We appreciate that. Richard, our field trip person, is I think down in South America. So, uh, you know. But he usually gets up here and says something like, well, there it is. <laughs> and so there it is. Look at this lineup. I have to tell you, I was at a chapter meeting, a Zoom meeting the other day, and we have more field trips in our chapter than any of the other chapters in North Carolina. <laughs> A lot of it's because of the dedicated people we've got, like Ron, and Steve, and Judy, and others. And it's just wonderful. So there's the lineup coming up this March. You can see all these opportunities. <clears throat> we now have three nominees, but we're still open for any other suggestions to nominees for the board. Probably by next month, we'll be able to be slight nominees soon, and we'll have a vote. And we'll uh, get the new members officially approved. But again, if anybody has any suggestions for nominees for the uh, back and third out of the board, please let me know or any of the board members. So. <laughs> now, here's one of the benefits you get if you serve on the board. Angel's going to come up here and tell you about this. Hi. Uh, so, most of the time, the mail is memberships and bills. But in the last past couple of months, we got this um, letter from the Montessori School. Uh, Dear Mecklenburg Audubon Society, we are Dylan W, Aria B, and uh, Millie C. And we have a question about cedar wax. <laughs> Do you know if cedar wax flames mate for life? Sincerely. <laughs> Dylan W, Aria B, and Millie C. P.S. It is for a report. <laughs> so we knew we had to do something. You know, we had to respond because you know, we wrote the authors you didn't hear from them until you were in the next grade, you know. So yeah, you kind of have to respond. And so several of us like really like jumped on this and pooled information and resources and pulled together the, the important answers. And I was the one who uh, composed the letter, kind of third grade-ish, 
I try to fit right about there and uh, send it back in. We haven't put it back yet, but I want you to, I did compliment them on their letter writing skills <laughs> and also their drawings. Look at the, can you tell like it's like nest of eggs? <laughs> can you tell us this is cedar wax and it's not a berry? <laughs> and do you see it's waxy tips? And can you tell us a female? <laughs> She's got eyelashes. <laughs> so she's adorable. So in case you wanted to know, like I now know more about the mating habits of cedar wax swings than anybody, I guess. Um, they do the mating dance, not like partners, they see each other, but they kind of pop back and forth and take, you know, trade the berry back and forth. And then if the girl gives it back at the end, you know, it's like, you're a real nice guy for a friend. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if, if she keeps it, then that's you know, it's a good thing, you know, they're engaged. Um, and then, of course, they live most of life in the flock. Um, they breed in the mountains in North Carolina. They do not breed around here. You see them outside of breeding season here in their flocks looking for food. Um, they are do not make for life. They make for a season. So they are faithful for that whole season. They may uh, have uh, two or uh, you know, at least two broods during uh, the breeding season, but they don't necessarily pair up again next year. So that was the answer to the question. And then the other thing I learned was like the number of waxy tips is sort of like an eight marker. And if you're if you're a nice mature, you know, cedar wax, when you go for the mature cedar wax, it's the same kind of number of, of waxy tips on the wings and the tail. And then the younger generation has fewer waxy tips and they kind of pair off with a uh, similar generation. That was something I could never imagine. So this is why you get to be on the board to you know, answer questions, you get to, to share the love, um, you get to do research that you didn't know you were ever going to do. So it was a lot of fun. They don't, they're actually here all year. They they kind of they kind of do that um it's more food source, it's more food source. So they they like we see them now here um in the early spring before mating and all you see them in the winter sometimes in the fall, but then you won't see them here in the Piedmont in the they're up in the northern states if you go up to the top. Yeah, they go up. Yeah, they do like that up there too. Yeah, that was a bird I always knew. Yeah, they're up there. <laughs> Vermont, you know, you see them in Vermont. Don't see anybody rushing up. <laughs> Thank you, Angel. I have one announcement, and that is that we're trying to get together anyone to form a little subcommittee who might, might be interested in pursuing the possibility of what's called a modus power in the show. We put that as one of our goals this year, and we've been discussing and planning for that. A modus power is a power now that is able to pick up radio transmissions from little nano receiver or nano transmitters on birds. And they're springing up all over the place, not only in the Carolinas, but worldwide. There are over a thousand modus towers. So, if anybody has a particular interest or expertise in that sort of thing, please let me know or any of the board members know. We'd be glad to have you. We'll help form a committee on Any other announcements? We've got one coming up now an announcement. Well, since Richard's not here, I'll just say, well, there it is. <laughs> I don't know if you are familiar with the every year, and I think this will be the eighth year that uh, North Carolina Audubon goes to Raleigh and meets with our state uh, legislature, and we advocate for the birds. And this is a photo of us last year. We had about 15 people from Mecklenburg on on to meet with their uh, state house and state senate um, legislators. 
And last year we had a huge win. We advocated for three things. And um, a big win was we got a native plant spill passed last year. And um, this year we're going back in May and um, we have three issues this year. We had a big win with native plants, but we had a big loss because um, we lost about more than 50, more than 50 percent of North Carolina wetlands came out of protected status. See what do you think happened in the North Carolina legislature last year that may have caused that change? That is about 2.5 million acres of land that was protected, but is no longer protected. So this year we are going to Raleigh on May 22nd, and we're going to advocate for more protected wetlands, more conservation funding, and, and an issue that didn't succeed last year, the air property bill, which essentially protects land um, from being lost when someone dies without a will. And so sign up will open next week. Please join us. It's actually a lot of fun. And I learned so much from the process that I started writing letters to all the legislators and even the ones who um, could sponsor the bill, even though they weren't my state uh, representatives. And it really makes a difference if you are there represented as a constituent because I got back a bunch of emails saying, Thank you, Representative So and So loves to hear from his constituents, <laughs> which I wasn't. So they were basically telling me to shut off. So, especially if you're outside of Mecklenburg County, please join us so we can speak to some of those representatives. Manisha, don't they provide some uh, online trainings and stuff to kind of prep prep you? We will have training sessions. Um, so, yes, you will be fully armed with information and, um, yeah. Make a difference. <laughs> All right. Judy Walker could not be here tonight. This is probably the first meeting I think I've been to where Judy hasn't been here banning all of our IT for us. She is in there in Hawaii. She's a lot. Yeah. That's a different place. No doubt. Anyway, <clears throat> next month we're going to hear from Judy. Excuse <clears throat> me. All about hummingbirds. So if you love hummingbirds, be sure to come next month. We're going to hear a presentation by Judy about hummingbirds. Tonight we're going to be get to hear from some youngsters. I'm going to recognize Steve who's going to introduce them. Thank you, Larry. It's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers tonight, Chris uh, Brown Edwards and Amy Kornfeld, and they're both recipients of grants from Mecklenburg Audubon that partially funded their summer activities, and that's what they'll tell us about. Strummer's going to go first, and his title is Bird Batting at the Blonde Bat Focal Station. Uh, Strummer graduated from Myers Park High School in December. And this summer is going to be a long point bird observatory. And in the fall, he's going to be attending Louisiana State University to study natural resources and ecology. And I'll introduce Ava and it's her turn. Strong. <laughs> We have like this clicker. Yes, awesome. here we go. Okay. Let me get your thing up here. Uh, Good. Screen. Am I good? Like with the camera angle. Um. Do you want to be seen? Okay. Then we're gonna make you seen. Look at this. There, really there we go. Uh, well, let me do this. That's one more thing I got to do. Can you all hear me? Are you... Okay. Cool. Uh, my name is Strummer Edwards, and as Steve mentioned, uh, this uh, last summer, Mecklenburg Audubon helped pay for me to go to Western Denmark and uh, volunteer at Blavon Fugle Station, where we would spend the summer either ringing pathrines or uh, monitoring shorebird migration. So I got there in early July, 
And at that point, it was really just shorebird migration. Lavin is kind of the foremost point for that in Scandinavia. Um, and in general, like it was heavily dependent on wind conditions. But on the right days, you know, we would start very early in the morning. We're far enough north that like the sun's rising at 445 and you have to get like you get have to get there 15 minutes before, you wake up like 20 minutes before. So it was like 4 a.m., 3 50 a.m. days. But we'd be there for five hours and you could get three thousand birds in a single day if the winds were right. So I've passed a few pictures below. Um at the bottom left, those are four northern lap ones. Um they're not most of these pictures that I'm in hand are not gonna be very high quality. They're mostly digiscope. But um, I'm sure a few of y'all know what they look like because they do occur as vagrants in North America every now and then. But it was a really good bird in the area where we were, where as migrants, it's really only gonna be when we had good southeastern winds. Another great bird we had during the uh, the morning watches was a Kentish clover. Um, they're roughly annual in that area, but we actually had a few that season just when the winds were right and when conditions were good. Also attached little gulls and one of the really common species were uh, Eurasian curlews. So we'd um, regularly on a day, on a single day, you could have like 70 Eurasian curlews and also 70 wimbles. And it's, uh, uh, there's a different subspecies from the ones we have here. So, you know, in like say Texas where you get long billed curlew and wimbrel, we were dealing with Eurasian curlew and um, European wimbrel, the Pitsonian. Um, also attached there, we were, there were a lot of local breeders around Blob and the birding wasn't insane. Um, it's, like it would be later on in the season, but there were some really cool birds. That's a common house martin. They're a lot like tree swallows, except with like a blue iridescence instead of a green. And that was literally right above the front door. They would just line the entire house, and it was really incredible. Um, these are a few other highlights from the early season. Um, in the bottom left of the common cuckoo, they were very early migrants. We only saw a few of them there during the entire time we were there. Right above that's a red back shrike. They were everywhere in the military area. And I'm not sure if y'all can see it, but they have this really cool pink wash to their breasts. And they're just beautiful. Um, at the top right, that was also in the military area, is a white wagtail. So Blob is one of three areas in Denmark where since the end of World War II, it's been devoted as both a natural area and an area for military training. So throughout the season, what they do is, particularly since the war in Ukraine started, they've been doing a lot of plane exercises, tank exercises. So it was it would close off every now and then, but like on days where they were dropping bombs, you would like be ringing birds in the room, and then just it would shake. You could like go out and see a smoke plume just a ways out, but um, it's standing right above one of the signs that was warning people that like they were doing active shooting there a lot of times. Um, before so we also had to do a lot of net lane prep. Um, where we had nets open, where we were going to catch birds later on, those were in the gardens, which was by the lighthouse and by the like the actual house we were staying in, which was the former lighthouse keeper's house. Um, at the bottom right, that's a hoboland trap. I'll touch on that later. And those were some of our mist net trails that um, we like really thoroughly cleaned out before the season would begin, so you know plants wouldn't get caught in the bottom one. So for the first few days of this, or for the first few weeks of the season, it was pretty slow. We were mostly catching like local young birds and also um, a few migrants. It was mainly the green warbler, which is the, I, I put the Danish name, but um, on the right side, it's global. And they're really, they were really cool. So um, their whole thing with aging them, you would look at the uh, greater coverts, which are right above the secondaries. And the idea is that if they had any wear, that would mean they were an adult bird because the feathers weren't new. Um, Tasha, that's in like a bird in formative plumage, which means it's not in juvenile anymore, but it's in the plumage before they turn into like fully adult plumage. And I've also attached a few pictures of just straight up baby hickory warblers we caught. It's a, bit, it's a bit hard to see, but like this bird had no tail. And also you can see its secondaries are still actively growing in. Um, and then on the uh, bottom left, that was a lesser white throat. And I'm not sure if y'all can see it here, but it was just completely flat. Like there was nothing else on it. And with birds like that, we would actually bring them back to the net we caught them from and release them there, just because they're very young and they're not great flyers. A few other highlights from the early season. Um, it's a house sparrow at the bottom left. And I know we really don't like them here, but um, in Denmark, they're actually, in Europe in general, they're not doing that well because they're really heavily tied to human land usage. And as that changes, they're, they're not just doing as well as they used to be. Um, we only had a pair there that was breeding by the house and then like 20, 30 Eurasian tree sparrows. So that was really exciting to finally catch one. 
that's a, a European blackbird right there. Um, and they are incredible. They're uh, a thrush, but um, they're very common captures later on in the season. But we only got one adult in the two months I was there. Um, in the middle, uh, I'm not sure if some of y'all have heard of it, but it's a Eurasian rhinek. And the pictures don't really do it justice, but it's a woodpecker. And its whole thing is that when it's in hand, they'll extend their neck and just whip it around in a circle to imitate a snake. So their uh, Latin name is actually Jinx Tranquilla, just because historically they've been like associated with witches and witchcraft because they're really, really weird. Um, right below that, it's a younger uh, European blackbird, but it actually had a lot of fishing line tangled around its foot that we were able to remove after we caught it. And one of the cool things that usually when you're banding, it's the way you're helping birds is in like very long-term data sets. And it's kind of cool to be able to like you tangibly help this individual bird survive. Um, right by that, it's a stone chat. It's an old world flycatcher. And it's got a very long name. Now they like split it a while ago and just like the Danish name because they decided to add a few extra words. <laughs> but um, they're, it's really cool. They're common throughout Denmark, but it's really the only station where you catch them. So for Danish people visiting the station, it was really exciting when we get one. And right above that also a white wagtail species that does occasionally occur in the US. This was probably the best catch of the season. It was um, a Eurasian green woodpecker. Um, and this one, it was a first year female. You could tell based on the uh, black stripe right here on a male, it would be red. Um, the crazy thing about this bird, so the Helgoland trap I mentioned earlier, it's basically, it's a big cage that opens very wide and then it gets more and more narrow as you go in it. It's got like mesh surrounding it. And then at the very end, it's got a box. Ideally, it's meant to be used when like, on a station that has bad weather, you can open this no matter what. Um, ours was not very good. It's partially that's young, so like the vegetation has grown up. We caught like five birds in there the entire season, and this was one of them. And the great thing was, I touched the picker, picture down below. It flew in without us having to chase it in there. And what we assumed was that there were a few dead beetles inside the main box. So it probably just flew in, thought it was a quick snack, and then we shut the door and we got it out of there. Um, this was a like it was the first this time we caught one in 60 years. This was an insane bird. Um, sometimes we weren't able to ban. Usually that's when uh, the wind would be above 10 meters per second. Mist nets aren't really safe to operate. Like I mentioned earlier, that hook land trap was not very good. So it wasn't worth like checking it every 30 minutes. So a big event that stopped us from ringing was a gale that came in from the UK. And, you know, I like Southeastern birders know storm days can be very good for birding. Um, for us, we, we got a ton of kitty wake. Usually we'd get one once every few days, but we got a thousand in one day, which was the most that we've recorded in 25 years, I believe, which, you know, when you're monitoring every single day, that's really impressive. The highlight of that, of the gale though, was we got to see, um, multiple storm petals in a single day, specifically European storm petals. And prior to them being caught in Skagen, which I'll mention later, they were probably the hardest bird to find in Denmark, just because European storm petrels, you probably, if you're sea watching for like every day for the entire autumn, you'll get one, maybe two. And that's every day. They're unchaseable because they're just like bouncing really quickly and there's no plastic. Tip. So it's the type of thing where like blisters who had been birding in Denmark for like 40, 50 years were missing them. So it was really incredible that like all of us, some of us were from Germany, like hadn't been birding for too long or hadn't been spending too much time in Denmark, got like one of the best birds you can get there on like, you know, our third week there. I've also touched some not great digit scopes of the kittaway. And it was just incredible because we use clickers to record the um, birds that are flying in in large numbers. And it was just like every second, one kitty, kitty one kitty, kitty. And we like, it would just keep on stocking up where I think we had like 200 in a 30 minute period at one point. It was really insane. Yeah. After the gale, like when you get started to get to mid-August, the numbers really start to pick up quickly. Um, we would regularly get like 70 to 80 bird days, occasionally in 100 plus per day. And I've just attached a few of the cool birds we caught during that period. Um, yeah, sorry. So that's a European robin right there at the uh, top right. They are the most common capture later on in the season. You can get like 100 in a day. They are incredible. They're so great in hand. They never fight. They don't get distressed. They're the perfect size. I love them. Um, but then to the left of it is a starling, and they are as bad as their reputation is in the States. They are, they are not fun to handle. But um, below that, a few other cool birds. There's a rhinek in the center there that you can't see is starting to do its neck thing. Um, to the left of that is a Eurasian tree creeper, very similar to our brown creepers. 
And then uh, uh, down next, and then on the far right, it was a uh, gold nail con red star. So we have our American red stars that are New World Warblers. This is like the original red, original. Um, but they're actually old world fly catchers. And the adult, like they all have that really bright tail. So they're really incredible birds. Um, well, yeah. I, mean, I might have to advance it. Okay. okay. Um, one of the big groups we're catching, we're catching a ton of warblers. And I'm, for those of you who've heard of like European birding philosophers, warblers have this terrible reputation for being like impossible to ID. They're basically um, our new world fly catchers. Um, we were catching a lot of those and also Silvidae warblers. Um, they, Europeans kind of called everything a warbler at one point. So there's, a, there's like 600 warbler species in five different families. Um, a few of the main ones we were catching though, um, at the top left, that's a common chip chap. Bottom right, willow warbler. Then there's a wood warbler to the left. And I, the willow and woods look very similar, but after you've gotten like 40 willow warblers in a day, it's the green really pops on the wood. Uh, the top right, that's a common white throat. We were catching a ton of them. One of the really cool things was this was a recapture from earlier in the spring. So that's one of the really great things about disbanding. When you're capturing birds that have already migrated through early on, you can learn a ton about their migration patterns, their survivorship. That's really important data. Right below that, that's a sedge warbler. And also, like, I think it's very nice that you can get the old German observatory and then, like, the um, Helgeland trap just in that one picture. But that's a very common bird that I wouldn't have gotten had we not gotten really lucky and caught it in habitat I'm not supposed to be in. Just aging, I'm not gonna go too far into this, but um, the aging techniques for all of them were really fun. Um, at the far right, that's a garden warbler and they have this really cool molt where basically um, after they're juveniles, they have a partial molt, so they'll retain juvenile feathers while also having their um, post juvenile feathers. And then for adults, Unlike most birds where they have a complete molt, so it's all one generation of adult feathers, they also have that partial molt. So what we look for, because all of them could have molt limits, usually when you see molt limit, you think a first year bird, we'd look for the level of wear that the uh, that the feathers would, were retained to have. So that's an adult bird, and the way we can tell the tertials, which are, um, are like noticeably more faded and more brown, because those feathers are a year old. So they've been in the sun a lot more, they've been exposed to conditions a lot more. Uh, for common white throats, we used a different technique. We would look at the tail feathers a lot of the time. So the top bird for the tail, that's a young bird. And we'll see the outermost tail feathers are a lot more cloudy. Bottom bird is an adult bird, it's a lot more white. And then if you look at the coverts on that picture, it's uh, which are the feathers above the secondaries, it's a lot more light brown on the younger bird and it's this deeper chocolate brown on the adult bird. Willow warblers, they've got um, yellow streaking when they're young and it's a lot brighter yellow. So you're looking for like a duller bird with a clear cutoff for an adult bird. This was the best bird of the season for me. <laughs> Common as a pigeon. Um, they like, we just call them fat idiot pigeons. Um, <laughs> I, I, I talk about this bird a lot. Um, the thing about big birds is that they're really good at bouncing out of nests. Just because the idea is it's kind of like falling into a hammock. That's how we catch the birds, and then they tangle themselves. Um, with a bird that big, it's just going to come in, bounce out. So they're really hard to get. You basically have to be there when they fly in and just grab around them. Um, and multiple times, like the really annoying thing about wood pigeons is that they'll tell you when they're there because they leave this big, like, cloud of feathers. Um, so it was like four times I was constantly talking about them. And then like, I was talking to like two of my friends, one of them I was ringing under and the other was just like coming on a net run with us. The morning shorebird surveys had been over. And they basically said, you're probably not gonna catch one this season just cause they're really hard to get in the net. And then like, we check the first net. I start going to the second one and one flies in right in the pocket above their head. We grab it <laughs> and it was, they're incredible. They are so fat. Um, they weigh a ton. They're really big. This was a young bird, so presumably not super savvy to where the nets are. But like, you can see this picture right there. This was like the little sock rack we would hang our uh, the birds we caught in, and you can just see how huge it is. Because <laughs> you know we had to play the big bag while we were doing the other birds. And incredible bird. This was this was so cool. Um, Sorry. All right. I think it's because I moved the camera. It does it does weird, unexpected things. So. This was another really cool thing we had happen. So Skagen, which I mentioned a bit earlier, it's the northernmost observatory. We basically had uh, the two leaders of Skagen, Seaman and Lisa, 
they um, came down and led an advanced screening for it. And what that was, was it was five or six A and B level license holders, which means station managers, all came down to the um, station for a weekend and learned from them. And the great thing was that it was people who had been ringing for either as long as I've been alive or like double that. So I got to learn from like these very experienced ringers and then they left courses on sculling, ethics, like very like the minutia of certain uh, aging techniques. A fear or two of the cool captives we had, another Rhinex, the European pipe fly capture, and also one of the cool things that was the way we had to hold them just because their legs are small, their wings are very powerful. So that's a way that you mitigate the risk of injury for birds like that. That picture right there, it was us trying to catch a night jar. Um, and the trick is you set up a mist net in the middle of the night, and then you grab a smartphone, you tape it to a megaphone, and then you just play a night jar call screw it for like a few hours. So we'd be in the house and we could hear it like blaring through the walls. We didn't catch any, but it was, it was, a, it was a fun effort. So, oh, okay. um, so for the last week, I was pretty much on my own. We had uh, Ben, who was an older station manager on site, but I was doing that check alone. I was ringing birds in the station alone. And it was really cool to have a bit more opportunity to like have more responsibility. Um, the one, the one other great thing is that as the season got later on, or as we got later into the season, we got to have later mornings just because the sun was rising at a later point. Um, a few of the cool birds, like we were catching a lot more birds at that point. That's just half of the captures from the network on the little sock rack because we'd have the lighthouse garden on top, the station garden below. Um, right to the left of it, that's a um, gold crest. It's got like my favorite Danish name. It's Fugelkonke. So they're related to kinglets, and what that means is it's bird king, um, because they've got like this crown. But the other really cool thing, there's this tiny warbler called a palace's leaf warbler. That's like they're they're the size of hummingbirds, and they can weigh the same amount. Um, palace's leaf warbler, which is that same size, is called Google Konge Sanger, which means bird king warbler, just because it's like the same size. Because that's a very common bird to that mark. To the left of it, we were catching a ton of crossbill which was, it's the same red cross, which is a different type than we have here, but it's really cool. Um, we just got lucky, that's not normal, but like for some reason, it wasn't an invasion year. They just decided that they liked the pond and that we had a net by, and they decided that they liked the pine trees above our other nets, and we just kept on catching them. Those are three young ones we caught in a single net run, and then to the right of it, that's um, a second year male that you could see it had this really cool like mixture of bright red and yellow plumage. It was like these beautiful fall colors. Above that, we start catching a lot more robins, which come very common later in the season. And then right there, that's a very common adder. Um, I like, it was a snake I was really hoping to see the entire time. And the one time it decided to show up, it was when I, I had no ch other choice but to completely focus on ringing. And it was blowing net with like eight birds in it. So I just had to like take a quick picture of half of its tail in a pile of grass <laughs> and call it a day. But it was really, really cool. This was the final highlight for the season. So, bar warblers are rare bird. One of the things, one of the person people I was ringing under, it would have been a lifer for her. And we were constantly talking about how excited we were to finally get one. And they're usually caught like late August, mid, or sorry, late July, mid August. She was there for that entire period. We didn't get one. She leaves. We did not, on Tuesday, we're not ringing Wednesday. On Thursday, it's a terrible day with like six birds. I'm on like my second to last net run. I check the net. And it's there. And it was like this is a this is a pretty. They look very similar to garden warblers, which are a super common captors. So I like I take it. I'm like this is a pretty big garden warbler. Eh, it's got a pinkish face. That's weird. Oh, it's undertail coverage are barred. And then I I kind of felt terrible because like I was stealing this lifer from her. <laughs> Here are a few pictures. It was a really beautiful bird, and it is big. Um, it was the first record since 2021. Um, and you can see there, it does, it's a very young bird. So all of that is juvenile feathers. But they do this really cool thing similar to the garden warblers where they don't molt all their feathers. So when you see an adult wing, and y'all should look up adult barred warblers after this because they look insane. Um, they'll have like three generations of feathers ranging from gray to dark brown to like light brown because they've been in the sun for so long. Um, kind of just takeaways from the experience. It was really great being in a station where you got to meet so many people and like mostly Danes, future, like people from all over and people who like were really invested in birding and in ringing. So just a few pictures like of, um, that's me with Dent in the bottom left. He was that station manager. He had been running the station since the 80s and like stepped down in early 2023. And that's, he doesn't get paid for that. 
like he just likes doing it. And it was really great to learn from him that he's like, he cared so much about women. Um, that's our little schedule board that uh, Yosef, one of the guys we're going to write, draw me in the little smiley face whenever it was my job. Um, attached to that is the staircase we had. It was the lighthouse keeper's quarters. Um, uh, Y'all have been on lighthouses, like the steeps are, or the stairs are very steep. It was terrible. It was like a flight and a half of those. And it, like every time you went down, you felt like you were going to fall down and like break your leg. Um, we had a great, it was really cool. Like the European stations have incredible libraries where they have like 50 years of knowledge just on the shelf. You have old Danish uh, record books. We had like this big book of aging East Asian migratory patrons. Like it was really random and cool stuff. In the center, that's a picture of us at the 60th anniversary where we had people from like Australia come over. It was really insane. But yeah, it was just, it was so special to be able to learn from a place that has so much history. And I'm really grateful for Mecklenburg Avalon for giving me the opportunity and helping me get to this point. Yeah. Is anybody going to talk about until after? Let's go ahead. Yeah, I have a few questions for some of them. Yes. Um, I wish I could bottle the boy in the suit. <laughs> what do you think about the suit? Because I would think it's a suit. Um, so your first slide, shorebirds. Shore mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sorry, early shorebirds. Yeah. yeah. So, Short. I mean, when I'm being lazy, I'll call them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So like I could say, shorebirds are <laughs> Yeah. No, that's that'd be really accurate too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another thing, I've never heard of Um, that's just, it's just what Europeans call banding, um, and like you get into that habit when you're there, like it's like. It's weird if you call it band, but yeah. Okay, so sculling is something that's really common in North America now. It hasn't really caught on in Europe. Basically, you know when like babies are first born, they've got a soft spot on their head. So that's, and eventually the second layer of the skull grows in. On birds, particularly on gold crests, they're really hard to identify the age group if you're not sculling. But what you can do, you just grab a little bit of water, you uh, part the feathers on their skull, you have a headlamp, and then you just shine the light through and move the skin around a bit. It doesn't hurt them at all. Um, but you move the skin around a bit, and you can see the windows that are left by the ossification happening. So skulling is just a short name for that. Great. Uh, anything else? Or... Thank you, Stroke. <laughs> Our second speaker tonight is Anna Kornfeld. She's a senior at East Netherlands High School, who graduated this spring, and Ava received a grant to attend two young birders camps, one in Colorado, sponsored by the American Birding Association, and another one in Michigan, sponsored by Michigan Auto. So, <laughs> you can you can put it on your head. It might work. Okay, like that. No, but that works. That's gonna work. Okay. Um, my name is Ava Kornfeld, and um, like Steve said, um, Mecklenburg Audubon helped me go to two um camps last summer. One um in Michigan, which I'm gonna talk about first, and then one in Colorado. Um, they budge that out of your way. Yeah. Um. So in Michigan, we um we stayed at Alma College, which is like a really teeny college in Alma, Michigan, and which is kind of like in the middle ish of the Lower Peninsula. And um, so on the first day, um, we went to Forest Hill Nature Area, which is in Alma, and um, we banded for a couple of hours, which I'll show pictures of on the next slide. And um, we walked around, and then we went to Vestiburg Bog, which is also Alma Club Ecological Station, and some of my favorite birds. We um, didn't see a ring neck pheasant, but we heard one, and um, that was, their calls are really weird. Um, 
My got my life with Willow Flycatcher and Yellow Coated Serio and a lot of yellow warblers and ended up laughing and uh that's a tree swallow and the willow flycatcher. Um, Let me do that for you. So um this was the banding that we did. Um that's this is a um, female after second year coming yellow throat um that I got to release after it was banded. We didn't get to do any banding like ourselves, but we watched the uh, demonstrations of it. Not as fun as what's trying to And but we got to release her. So that's me holding the yellow throat. And then um we caught which was presumably the same willow flag that uh is right there. Um, a female after seven years that has like a full brood patch, which the female birds like I think they like lose the feathers on their stomach, yeah. Um, to when they have nests to like form up their face. Um, and so you could we could tell that um, she was a very angry mother. So, <laughs> um, we got a female after hatch year cow sparrow with a full brood patch as well, and um, that's a wing spread of a house sparrow and um, a great catbird. And then a male, I think, after second year um, American goldfinch, and then a picture of the mist nest, which um, Stromer talked about, which like they get in and then they like fall and the hammock changes and stuff. Um, and then that. Other picture is um, all of the bands um, that we had, different sizes. And then, so day two was, I think, my favorite day in Michigan because we got to see the Heartless Warbler, which I have a whole size in those um, nests. But so that was it here on National Forest. But um, we also, so the air quality when we were there was, I think, the highest it got to was like 280, which is very horrible. As you can see in my pictures, we couldn't see anything past like a pile of visibility. And um, we didn't have masks. So I was out from like 5 a.m. to like 6 p.m. without a mask in the 250 air quality. It was not fun, but oh, we got some good points for them. Um, I got my life in Virginia Rail. Um, we got to see up with sandpipers, which I have some very bad pictures of. Um, they're like a mix of. Oh no, you, <laughs> you you can walk up to it, sure. That's all right. That's all right. And then um, we got a uh, brewer of blackbirds and a nice scarlet tanager and black terns, which were really cool. And um, a couple of worlds and snipes and um, nesting box ones that had babies. Um, and then this is so the Heartland Warbler is probably my favorite bird of Michigan just because it was really cool to see. Um, they're conservation dependent birds and they're really stupid because they only they nest at like the, the bottom of uh, jack pines that are only like less than five years old because that the ones that are less than five years old have the most branches on the bottom to like hide them from predators. So they require like this constant like planting of of more jack pines or they will literally die. Um so this is like a very protected area of jack pines, which you can see in the pictures. Um and yeah, I got some really bad pictures and I tried my best to save them, but it was so like smoky outside that it was really hard to even see them in person, which I would like to like go back to better weather <laughs> and see them again. Um, and then day three, we went to um, Chippewa Nature Center in Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and we got Cassidy Kearns. I got my life with um, <laughs> um, Cliff Swallow, which is uh, this bird right here. And at first, I don't know, we thought it was a different swallow, but then it just, it had this weird like model face, we weren't 100% sure, but then 
um, we realized that it was a twin swallow. And um, a lot of purple martins and three swallows. And um, we got to see a, this is an American woodcock nest that the, unfortunately, the babies had already hatched. So just the hatched eggs were there. But um, so then woodcock would be my nemesis for a piece of that. I saw a nest, but I had never seen that. But I got not my first one. Um, and then day four, day four maybe was my favorite day instead of the crow. Because it was really fun. Can you move the picture there? Oh, sure. Um, we went to a random road in Michigan and um, we got a singing male monetary warbler, which was really cool. Um, and we also went to Kensington Metro Park, which is known for their habituated birds. And it said, don't be the wildlife, but um, we said the wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> so um, someone uh, has a rose rusted rose rose plant in the can which I'm really jealous of someone having. Um, but I had a, um, a couple white rusted nut hatches and um, uh, Texas titmouse. And then the bottom left corner is just was the sunrise and the sun was red because of the smoke, which is kind of terrifying. Um, and I got my first picture of a black hat chippy, which I had heard a couple of days prior, but yeah. So Kensington was really cool because we got to meet the birds, even though they were so <laughs> I got it. I think I got it. Oh, there. I got that. And then, so also after that, um, it got, Kensington got rained out. So we went to the um, University of Michigan Museum of Natural History. So here's a couple of pictures from that. Um, that was pretty fun. We just got to walk around. And then after that, we got to go to their specimen collection, which it was the first specimen collection that I had ever seen. And um, that was a really cool experience. Um, this is the first Portland's Warblers nest that was ever found, ever. And they just had it, and that was cool. Um, this is a ruby throated hummingbird next to a, a giant. Um, passenger pigeon, Carolina parakeet, great off skeleton, and an ivory bill woodpeckers. That was awesome. Is that a kiwi? Yeah, it's a kiwi. Oh my goodness. They're cute. Next to a plumber moon and a eel. Um, so that was cool. And smelled really good. <laughs> and then some of my favorite. Um, other things that weren't birds were, I think Landing Squirtle was my favorite reptile that we saw there. Um, it was a pretty like upcoming site for the area and they were really cool. Um, then it's finding soft shell turtles and then some cool flowers. And we had a lot of snakes and a dead poly. Um, but then I, a couple weeks later, I had like a week and a half break, and then I got to go to Colorado, which was sponsored by the American Hunting Association. And Colorado was a really incredible experience. We got to go to so many different environments, and it was really cool. So on the first, we stayed at the Estes Park YMCA, which is at like 8,000-ish foot elevation. Um, and we got broad tailed hummingbirds, black tailed magpies, violet green swallows, ground bluebirds, and white crown sparrows that were all pretty, like, much everywhere at the park. Um, and Wyoming's mountain squirrels, which are pretty hilarious little creatures, um, they're really loud. And I kept thinking that they were just birds because they kind of make this, like, screaming, like, whistling sound. <laughs> and then a lot of mule deer. Um, and that was the sunrise, I think, or maybe sunset. Uh, I don't know. But it was, some, it was orange. <laughs> and there was a broad field, which may be my favorite picture that I took that whole week. Um, and then on the second day, we went, we did foothills climbing. Um, we went to Rabbit Mountain and Old St. Drain Road in Boulder. Um, we got pretty terrible views of white throated swifts. 
and a black church running grid, uh, Golden Eagles, a census coordinator, and the Western Black Teacher, um, Save the Babies, um, the Bluebird is the National Atlantic, and um, the Orange Road is the Bullocks and Orioles. Um, we got this here for Skippers with really terrible bees, but they were pretty cool. Um, those are gold finches. Um, those are the swallow necks. Um, and spotted toadies, in case you guys know. And we got a lark sparrow, which is really interesting. And a red name is Um, mm. and some things. And then day three, um, we did Montaigne Rectarian Verdict, which I don't know if I can give you the definition of Rectarian, <laughs> but I think it's like the, the area for. Yeah. Um, so we um, went to Wild Basin area, which is part of our national park. Um, and we got my better views of the group. And um, I got, once they get split, it would be my life for Audubon, you know, the <laughs> root And a lot of golden mans with ground squirrels, which carry the black city, um, and a black bear. Which was really cool. It was we were in our van and it was like probably like fifteen feet away or less, and that was cool. And red squirrels and chipmunks and Williams and sapsuckers, which are really awesome birds. They're like all black. You can barely see it, but um, yeah, those are cool birds. And then I'm not even gonna uh, like a few little phrase in one <laughs> which we didn't see. But cool. Hard to see. And then on day four, we went birding with Ted and Kenneth Boyd, which if you don't know who they are, they're um, Ted Boyd. They're part of the ABA. Ted Boyd is semi-famous. And uh, Hannah is his daughter. And she, she um, I don't know if she still does it, but she did the, uh, the young bird edition of the ABA magazine called The Fledgling. And so we murdered with them at Walden Pond Wildland Habitat, which is in Boulder. And it was actually the day before the Lincoln got spotted there. So um, we didn't get that Lincoln, but we got um, a pigeon. Um, we also murdered at the Weinstein a little bit. So we got phantom pigeons, um, more green tailed coveys, eastern kingbirds, and the eastern subspecies of warbling vireo. It was singing the eastern. Subspecies song, um, passing finches, um, red cross, but Lincoln sparrow, and that a western picture, and a white breasted nuthatch, and a lot of Um <laughs> and white breasted. Is that a moose? That is an elk. It was in the water on the side of the um, And then day five was one of my favorite days in Colorado because we did grassland birding at Pawnee National Grassland. And we did, um, so every year in, at Camp Colorado, they do a big day for one of the days, which if you don't know, it's like a day where you try to see the most birds that you can. Um, we were trying to beat last year's record, which I don't think we did, but um, we got a lot of good birds. Um, so at Pawnee, we got common night hawks, chestnut collar longs, birds, golden eagles, sage grasses, um, this, Beautiful swing to small, which we also had a dark one, but they wouldn't stop the tan. Um, so <laughs> I didn't get any pictures of that. Um, dark fun things. Um, a thick build monster up there. Um, moderate shrikes, golden eagles. But we had to see mountain gophers, which were really cute. Um, we had pronghorn run along our van with us, a big group of them. Um, which was really cool. They were like running at the same speed as our man, and that was pretty awesome. And a greater short horn lizard in the bottom right corner, and it was in the ant pile, um, as they do. Um, so, and then we went to Fossil Creek Reservoir, which is in Lama, and we got uh, both Western and Clark Streets, um, cinnamon fields. I don't remember what else, but those were the three. A lot of swallows. I got uh, my life a big swallow thing. We also got um, Bart's bear, bear sandpiper and um, Sora, which was cool, but I didn't see it. And everyone else did. <laughs> 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 and 
And then to be sick to Colorado was definitely my favorite day because it was like this environment that I had never ever even like dreamed of seeing before. And um so it was the Alpine and Sub Alpine Birding Day. And so first we went to we drove all the way up to Medicine Bow first, which is part of uh Rocky Mountain National Park, which was about like I think like eleven thousand five hundred ish elevation elevation. And um we walked like a half a mile and we got white tailed farm again, which that's my terrible picture of a moving rock. Um and a sage rapture, which the green picture in the middle ish, um, which was we thought was really weird at eleven thousand feet, but apparently it wasn't. Um White House Sparrow, that's the sparrow. Um, and the white tails and rounds were really cool to see, even though they weren't running at our feet, which they were the previous year. So those were really cool. And then after that, we took, as the day went on, we went further down the mountain. Um, well, first we climbed up a thousand ish foot elevation staircase up to 12,000 feet, and I was carrying my eight pound can, <laughs> and I could not breathe. Um, and, um, and then after that, we went to the lava cliffs, which are the snowy uh, mountain things. And we got, um, we were looking for brown cap rosy finch, and we were there for like 15 minutes and didn't have any. And then I think it was like the youngest kid in our group. He, oh no, he didn't the button. There you go. <laughs> uh, he was probably like 13. He was like, I got one, it flies right there. And then there was just a draft in group. It's like five feet in front of us. And uh, <laughs> the, it's this bird. And he was really big. And we watched him for a while. Um, and that was really cool. Um, and then after that, we went to the Tundra Community Trail and Rock Cut area where we got to see Pika, which are my favorite animals ever. Um, this and that. Um, they make the cutest noises and they like pick up a bunch of grass in their mouth and run around with it and they're so cute. And um, so we were all like lined up along this ledge and um, all of the people, even like the people that weren't part of our group, they were all mimicking the pika. Um, and so that was really cool. And they're like this big. And, um, and then we went to Rainbow Curve, which is almost at the bottom of the ground. Uh, and we got, well, not off the bottom. And um, permit, uh, singing permit thrush, which I don't think I had ever heard their like actual song before, maybe. And it was really pretty, and some more red cross goes and dark red chest goes, and then um, it was like nine thirty, and we had uh, we went owling, but it ethically failed, and we dipped on great horned owl, flame related owl, saw wet, uh, boreal, all of all of them. We didn't get a single owl. We saw some bats, and then um, we had coyote, yellow belly, marmots, and owl um, throughout the day. And then on the last day, we did more birding around Rocky Mountain National Park, and then we did banding, which is on the next slide. Um, but we got uh, Clark's Nutcracker, um, Tree Swallows, Western White Peewee, and all of Sided Flycatcher, which is bird only, but so cool. A baby zipper, which is probably the cutest thing I've ever seen. Um, Red shafted northern flicker, more red necked cat suckers, and mountain chickadee. Um, we got a snowshoe pair. Um, and you can't see it, but there's a baby picking a hatch in there and screaming. And it was really cute. Um, I think the Clark Duckard was my favorite bird that day just because it was like so big and we were so close to it. Uh, it was a really, really cool bird. And they make weird noises. Um, and a Lincoln Sparrow. And then there's me at the alluvial fan, uh, which I don't know how it happened, but it was this cool waterfall that was made by like maybe a landslide. I don't think it was, but um, that's pretty. And then 
expanding was really fun because I got to see a lot of birds that we'd seen throughout the week on float. Again, we did not actually get to fan them myself, but I got to release a white breasted nuthatch. Um, we got cast on suspensions and black headed growth at the feeder together, um, band club pigeon. Uh, this really angry hairy woodpecker up there. Um, we got a black abrus squirrel, which was really pretty, and a long-eared myotis bat flew right above our heads and landed in the tree. Uh, we think that it had issues. <laughs> um, we managed to group this hummingbird and brought that three birds, pygmy not hatches, uh, pine siskins, green duck milly, white crown sparrows, and so that was fun. And then this picture, I don't remember what day it was from, but that's my project of the bird picture that I really love. Um, and yeah. And then the plants and fish and growth, how this works. This is the, the trip that like made me interested in moths and butterflies. So I didn't take as many pictures with them as I should have because there were a lot of cool ones. Um, but now if I ever go back, I know that I like them and I will start taking pictures more. But we had this little dead bull snake that had a dead bird uh, right there, which we presume came out of its stomach. Um, which is a little gross. <laughs> um, uh, this blue columbine and the gunnus miraculosa lily are really pretty flowers. Uh, and this prickly pear I thought looked like a hand, which we got at Rabbit Mountain. There are prickly pears everywhere. Um, a magdalena alpine, which was a really cool butterfly. It's not my picture, it's my friend's picture, but I spotted it. I just didn't take a picture. <laughs> Um, but they have a really restricted range at super high elevation, and we got them with the pica. Um, I think, yeah. So I wish I had taken your picture. They did. And then this many spotted tiger moth was at um, the YMCA on one of the doors for a few hours, and I think it's one of my favorite moths that I've ever seen. Um, so takeaway is my comments too. <laughs> um, both these camps were really cool experiences because I got to see a lot of birds that I never probably would have seen, like the white tailed ptarmigan, if I hadn't done this. And I got to meet a lot of really incredible people. All of my counselors at Camp Colorado, like um, one of my counselors was named Jake. I don't remember his last name, but he was the person that um, that uh, got the first record of the um, Northern Bobook. I don't know how to say the word. The owl in Alaska? Um, D-O-O-K, D -O -O that bird. Um, and we got to meet um, Joanna Beam, who was the girl that um, uh, proposed the split for the meadowlarks. Um, and just a lot of cool people um, that I knew. And I still am in contact with them all. And, I got to learn how they all got to where they are today because they all have different careers in birding. And um, I got inspired because now I'm going to do, I want to do what they do. <laughs> um, one of them was a tour guide for uh, from tour business, and he like goes to a bunch of national parks and does touring. And I thought that would be really fun to do. And um, I went to Tim Hortons for the first time. <laughs> 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 Overall, thank you, Mrs. Rafaadabon, for helping me get to these camps because they were really fun and changed my life. I'm supposed to questions. Come on. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that. If you see the crazy black foot, don't blame the rooms. They didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> also, the pika is not the inspiration for the name Pikachu. It comes from the Japanese word for electric and the sound that bikes make. Any other questions? Where are you going to school? Oh, I'm going to go to Ed State and I'm majoring in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. Nice. All right. <laughs>
And your curiosity every time I see you put something on the bridge me. She is the lovers. She has a good version of them. Were they actually banding the hummingbirds? Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. I wanted to release one because they all, they just sat in your hand and you had to like pass them and they would they just be laying there like, are we supposed to die? That I wanted to release them. But yeah, they've been receiving them. How many hummingbirds did you see? We saw black chin, calliope, rufus, rock, and tail. I think that's it. The four? Yeah. At the giant one, that's just the third. That was just the third. <laughs> that was the third. So they have an FDA type of heavy SLR and rocking for a big step. Not yet. <laughs> um, and like that's it. Tell everybody why it was so smoky. The fires in Canada made it down to Michigan last year. And it was definitely, I mean, my parents were in the Upper Peninsula while I was um, down in the Lower Peninsula. And it was worse up there. But it was, I mean, being outside for like eight hours straight with no mask in that bad of, uh, air quality, <laughs> not super fun. We were really, really mad that they let them stay out all that day in the terrible. I mean, it, I was like, don't y'all have, like, what if it had been a tornado? It's a similarly dangerous situation. Oh, it's too very much. <laughs> Did you not have masks available? They were just like, we don't have masks. <laughs> and then my mom angrily called. Wow. Yeah, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> where were you? Yeah, we were we were at uh, the resort, so we couldn't try it. Oh, they gave us masks the next day, but then they the gave us a group day. of like sixteen year olds one mask for the whole rest of the week. And everyone had lost theirs by the end of the day. Oh. And then they didn't have them. How many kids were in the Um in Michigan, I think it was I was the first person that they had, had at the camp that was out of Michigan or Ohio. So we had to we drove in and that uh, yeah, and everyone was like, the North Carolina boys. <laughs> and I was like the last person to arrive, too. So I was famous. Um, and, and, and you told them you like snow. I did yeah, tell them you like snow. And they were like, yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, I think, like 14 to 17 or 18 um, age range. And then Colorado was. I think 13 to 17 or 18, and it was um, 12, no, 14 people. It was bigger than uh, Michigan, but it was people from everywhere. There was people from um, all over the US, and it was one of the people that had all had different like birding experiences. Like there was someone from Maine, uh, and she had done the, um, the camp up there where they got to see the puffing. Oh, um, so and that was the thing. <laughs> you have to make everybody jealous. Tell them where your school is. Enough of this. I don't know. Yeah. 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 And the other thing. Okay. Well, thank you.